Good afternoon, everyone watching us live today, and welcome to our third annual In Conversation With. We're so happy that you can join us today. And we're joined today by Richard Lancaster, who has been volunteering for Greenpeace for over 30 years now. And, this, and he's a software engineer by trade, um, but dedicates much of his free time to campaigning and delivering talks for non-governmental environmental organizations. And originally joining the anti-whaling campaign for Greenpeace, he's been part of Greenpeace for, since 1980. And he has extensive experience in campaigning and is convinced that climate change is the biggest challenge we face today and hopes that his work with Greenpeace will lead to a better future. So I'll pass it on to Richard to give a quick introduction about himself and, and we hope you enjoy this in conversation with. Hi, thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that introduction. Yes, so um, as I say, uh, as the introduction said, I'm involved with Greenpeace and uh, this morning I'd like to share some thoughts about climate change. And um, we're going to start by viewing um, a short video just to kind of set the scene. So uh, I'm going to do that without further ado. I'm just going to go in and uh, we're going to have a quick look at this uh, short video here. This is Argon! Industrial meat is making the people on the planet sick. It's destroying our forests. Losing our water. Causing climate change. And being mean to animals. We need to do something quick. I'll trust the team to sort this mess. Team plant. The grown-ups aren't stepping up. The world needs you now. We need to fix it. Got it. We need to investigate. Looking good, we need to be brave. We need to be skilled. We need to be confident. And we need to get the word out. Yes. We're calling for a change around the world. We need to eat less meat. And that's where you come in. We can't do this alone. Can you help us? So that, uh, that just sets the scene and uh, gives you an idea. And what I'm going to do now is to just give um, a short uh, talk um, about uh, this particular subject. So I'm just going to um, just set up my screen. And uh, essentially, um, we're going to be focusing on the impact that um, climate change, the, the links between climate change and industrial meat production. So um, we've got, uh, I'll just check that you can, hang on a moment. Let me just get that right, okay. Okay, so the Amazon, which uh, I guess many of you know quite a lot about the Amazon, it is the largest tropical rainforest in the world, it covers more than 5 million square kilometers and is spread across nine countries. So to put that in perspective, it's as large as the whole of the United States or Europe, and the map shows that there. And the first thing that we uh, need to understand about the, um, the uh, oh, about the, uh, the rainforest is that it supports a huge variety of animals and plants. And one of the key things that we're facing in the world at the moment is the loss of biodiversity. And uh, that it's just a few pictures there give you a flavor of the variety of animals and plants. 60,000 plant species, 1,000 bird species, 300 different mammals. 
And what a lot of people forget is that, that Amazon is home to over 20 million people as well. And when we're talking about biodiversity, um, you know, you've got some of those pictures there. And I've just pictured, and I'll just zoom in on one of those for a moment, the poison dart frog. And you may have seen seen these. I'm sure you've seen pictures of them. You may have seen them in uh, in other places. But even within just that little niche area of poison dart frog, there ain't one poison dart frog. There's dozens of poison dart frogs. And this is this is the beauty of nature and the beauty of biodiversity. And as I say, also within the Amazon, we have uh, a lot of 20 million people, but about 160,000 of those are indigenous people. They're the original inhabitants of the Amazon, about 500 different tribes. And the truth of the matter is that these indigenous peoples are as much in danger as all of the wildlife in the Amazon as well. They have been living in harmony with nature for many thousands of years. But because of the changes that are taking place in the Amazon at the moment, their livelihoods, their, their, in fact, their very existence is being threatened every day. So what, what are the threats? Well, the Amazon is being burnt and cut down. And this is a picture here, just shows you the sort of uh, devastation that's taking place. The top two thirds of the photograph show uh, a hugely deforested area where the Amazon has been either clear cut or burnt. And the bottom strip there shows what it should look like with a vast variety of trees um, and plants. And why is it being cut down? Well, first of all, it's being cut down for its wood and trees are being cut down. And some of these are a thousand years old and they're being cut down to make disposable items, you know, toilet tissue and, and paper tissues and so on, things that will be used a moment and then thrown away. And the Amazon is being destroyed at a frightening rate. And you may have heard these figures before. People quote them all the time. An area the size of two football pitches every single minute, every 60 seconds, an area the size of two football pitches. But it's even then hard to get that into perspective because an area the size of two football pitches every minute actually equates to an area of 8,100 square kilometers every year. And even that might be difficult to comprehend. So I've got a little comparison here. This is a map sort of of part of the southwest of England where some of us live. So down in the bottom corner, you can see the seven estuary and you can see Bristol. And up in the top right, we're almost over to Northampton. Top left is Worcester. That there is a square that's 90 kilometers by 90 kilometers, i.e. 8,100 square kilometers. That's the sort of area of Amazon rainforest that we're losing. That was the amount that was lost in 2019. It is really frightening. So we know that they're cutting it down to get the wood, but what else? Well, there's been a huge increase in ranching in the Amazon. The Amazon is now home to more cattle than it is to people. Uh, yeah, just there, you can just see. Um, so this is a typical scene that you see in large parts of the Amazon now, cowboys with cattle. So a large part of it is that, but it's also being cut down to grow two very popular and very versatile uh, plants. The top one there, you may not know what it looks like when it's growing, that is oil palm, and it's what gives us palm oil. And the bottom looks a bit like peas, but it's actually soya beans. And these are the two main crops. So apart from the, the, the ranching, the two main crops are oil palm and soya. And of course, oil palm, we now find in, it's estimated that something like 50% of all of the products bought in supermarkets these days contain palm oil. Everything from toothpaste to peanut butter to soap. It's, uh, it's a very versatile product that can be put in. It makes your soap 
uh, come out of these containers. It's uh, it's a uh, it's added to lots and lots of different foodstuffs and other products. And of course, the bottom picture, so soya. And soya is a large part of a number of people's diets. Uh, lots of vegetarians and vegans uh, consume a fair amount of soya. So you might think, well, OK, is it all those vegetarians and vegans that are the cause of the problem then? Is it them that's eating all this soya and they're the problem? But no, because, of course, the amount that's actually consumed by by humans in their diet directly is quite small. The majority of the soya is going into animal feed. And in Britain, a large part of the soya that we import, something like 90 percent, is used for animal feed. A large part goes to feed chickens like this and also pigs. So. The soya is going to produce meat as well. So we've got the ranching producing meat, beef. We've got the soya producing chickens and pigs. And the fact of the matter is that once you cut down the forest and you start growing soya or oil palm, you've destroyed the biodiversity. The top picture there shows the forest as it should be in the background. And then you can see that in the foreground, it's all been replaced by um, soya. And of course, there's no home for all of the variety of birds and mammals and insects that were living in the forest when you've just got field upon field, mile upon mile or kilometre upon kilometre of soya or oil palm. And the bottom shows, you know, the, the huge areas, the huge, I mean, you could call them fields, but they're, they're far bigger than any field that any of us will have seen. Uh, and uh, combine harvest is in a sort of a V-shape there, cutting down the the crop. So why why? But that's all right. But why are we so worried about the link between that and climate change? Then we can understand well, you know, the animals. But how does it affect the climate? Well, the truth of the matter is that um, we need trees. The trees absorb carbon dioxide. And I should just address one little thing here. A lot of people say, oh, well, you know, if we cut down all the trees, are we all going to suffocate because there won't be any oxygen? That isn't that isn't the problem. And although people talk about the Amazon being the lungs of the planet, a more realistic way of describing it is as the thermostat for the planet. It, it, it has a modifying effect on the planet. So the trees growing lock up carbon in their plant fiber. If we cut down the trees and we burn them, we release that CO2. And of course, CO2 contributes to climate change. What happens is that the sun's rays hit the planet. And whereas some of it would be radiated out when we increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, then less of it gets radiated, more of it gets bounced back to warm the planet. And the net result of that is more extreme weather. And it might be nice to say, well, if we were living in Bristol and we had a more Mediterranean climate, that would be quite nice. But of course, climate change doesn't work like that. What actually happens is you don't get nice, equal, slightly warmer weather so that we can uh, we don't need to go abroad for our holidays. What you get is you get heat waves, you get droughts, you get hurricanes, wildfires, wildfires, ice caps melting and you get flooding. So you get lots of extreme weather. So what can we do about it? Well, the first thing we can do is we can start considering our purchasing. And uh, as I said, oil palm and the trees for wood and the soya are the three, three of the key things which are, are causing the deforestation. So you can start off by looking for sustainable palm oil products. Look for these logos. The, the second one there is the sustainable soya. And the bottom one you can see at the bottom of that pack, the Forestry Stewardship Council. So you can look out for those things. The second thing you can do is to think about your own carbon footprint. Uh, you know, cycle rather than using your car. Make sure you recycle so that less new stuff's produced. Keep your electricity usage down, turn down your thermostat, take a shower instead of a bath and eat more plant based um, vegetables, uh, you know, vegetables and fruits. And 
eat seasonal and eat local if you can. Those all help. Now, I don't know, Anish, whether you want to share the one of the pledges now or do you want to do that at the end? Sorry, I should check that with you. I know, not to worry. Um, just thought that this would be a good kind of intermission to talk about how some of the viewers can actually see their own carbon footprint. So two very useful websites are the World Wildlife Foundation, where you can put in some of your habits. So if you drive to work, um, if you have a meat-based diet, then yeah, you can you can log in, put down your habits and find out how much your carbon footprint is. And it, it gives you some tips on how to reduce this. And another really good website is uh, geeky.com. So that's G-I-K-I.com. And you can put in, as you were saying earlier, looking at some of the, the ingredients that we buy, such as, um, such as peanut butter, you can scan the barcodes and you can see whether some of the ingredients in there are very are sustainable or not, or whether it's sustainable palm oil. And this are just a few steps in order to to make some of the like life choices that we make a little bit easier in, in taking proactive steps into reducing our carbon footprint by informing us on, on how to do so. So yeah, just two useful um, websites for our viewers to, to have a look at. Thanks, Anish. So I've been talking about plants being an important part. Why do I keep banging on about that? Well, the truth of the matter is if we take a look at this, we can see if we look at a typical North American diet, so that's the United States, Canada, it, heavy, heavy consumption of meat. It takes roughly two football pitches of land to feed one person because of how inefficient grazing animals are as a way of producing protein for humans. If you instead had a plant based diet, those same two football pitches area of land could feed 14 people. So two football pitches for one person, two football pitches for 14 people. The truth of the matter is that livestock contributes as, to as much to climate change as all the cars, trucks, planes, trains and ships on Earth combined. 14% is purely livestock. Now, you can get involved yourself. Um, there's things that you can do, those websites that Anish just mentioned. There's also lots of campaigning organizations that are working here. Greenpeace down the bottom there, there's Extinction Rebellion. There's organizations that are purely working with uh, indigenous uh, peoples like Survival. There's other organizations that are concentrating on planting trees and there's others that are concentrating on uh, reducing meat consumption. Now, some of these organizations are more radical or extreme than others, depending on your definition of extreme. Um, obviously, Extinction Rebellion and Greenpeace have done things which are, um, you know, at the limits of what's legal. And one of the things that you might consider if you're getting involved in the environmental movement is what are the ethics of protest? And I've just put up three photographs here, a uh, picture dating back to the uh, turn of the last century before last, moving from the 18th to the uh, 19th to the 20th century, the suffragettes. Uh, then through doing the 20s and 30s, the civil rights movement in the United States, and more recently, um, the environmental movement protesting against in this in this particular photograph, protesting against the oil companies. And you might like to consider, is it ever permissible to break the law if you firmly believe that your cause is just? And then finally, um, as people of faith, and um, I'm, I'm actually a Christian, but obviously I've been invited to talk to your Hindu group today, um, but uh, you might want to think about, you know, what the impact is, is on, on, on our faith. And there's a number of books that have been written by Christians and others who are people of faith talking about, um, you know, is God green or how does it affect and impact on your faith? Are we stewards of the creation? And in that case, what responsibility do we, do we have to act to mitigate and to uh, against climate change?
So that's uh, a very quick run through. I'll uh, stop my screen share now. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Richard, for that very, very insightful presentation. Um, I'm sure our audience have a, a few questions to ask us following, um, following that note. Uh, just to fill in there, it's really, really interesting points on, on how people can take uh, climate action and especially urging the government to take bold and ambitious actions indeed. Um, a few more pointers that I came across are, and, and would love to share are using energy wisely and also making sure that your energy provider, such as EDF or British Gas, do get their energy from renewable sources. And as you've, as, you, as you've highlighted on numerous occasions, eating sustainably and eating for a climate sustainable planet, uh, making sure your commute is green so if you can cycle to work. And I think this is one of the most important actions, uh, consuming less and wasting less and enjoying life more. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, we can now just kind of discuss a few questions here and there that, we may, that, that, may, that may have popped up from the audience. But one question that comes to mind is, so a lot of vegetarian, vegetarians kind of are in, in between um, becoming, becoming vegan and taking those actions. But can you highlight a few of um, information that you know about the dairy industry in, in the UK as such? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting, obviously, um, the uh, a lot of people are moving and reducing their consumption of um, of dairy. Um, dairy industry does have a big impact in terms of um meat consumption in the uk then most of our we don't import any meat i mean from the amazon we don't import meat from there uh, most of our, our our beef is is locally grown either in the uk or ireland but uh, obviously we do still have quite a big dairy industry and um alternatives i mean it's interesting uh, I, I i put my hand up i'm i'm not a vegan i'm a vegetarian so i should just point that out so i, I do eat um, some dairy um we um what we're finding is that um there are increasingly alternatives and the alternatives are getting better and the strange part is that um some you know i i i, I would never eat meat alternatives i just they don't appeal to me but there are um some vegetarians and vegans who quite like the idea of having something that looks like a piece of meat but they know isn't um so so that's quite an interesting thing that that some quite like these meat alternatives other uh, other people find the whole idea of trying to make something look as much like meat as possible quite a revolting idea so that's quite an interesting one um but i think also that um we're not even if everyone reduced their meat consumption without cutting it out altogether, it would make a huge difference. So, you know, we've talked about vegetarians and vegans, but the other term that's coming in far more is flexitarian, where people eat meat maybe once or twice a week, just not every day, but it becomes a treat. And in fact, you know, I'm not going to condemn those people because if the quality of that meat is better, that the animals are raised in, um, in a you know caring way and um the amount so the quality is better and the animal husbandry is is better then that's still a lot better than mass-produced meat that's fed on soya imported from the amazon that's been chopped down so you know if people are finding the journey hard then go go as far as you can along the journey you don't have to be you know it's not all or nothing it doesn't have to be you know if we all edge towards it then it will it'll make a big difference i think that's a great great point you've highlighted there and, and it is a case of and and or for people who do find it a bit tricky to to transition into into separate diets it takes it takes a big moment of change i i believe i, I had and makes it takes making that connection but as you say there's, there's an and and an or and one thing that I did read is kings are uh, in the history behind me is it used to be a very much a prestigious honor to have me and it used to be very much like um fit for fit for the rich 
but the way it's become now it's 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 part of our diet people consume meat on a day-to-day -day basis and and this overconsumption has caused such a depletion in the res in the resources that we have on this planet in order to sustain some of these diets and and we're, we're kind of david attenborough states this as well we're, we're living on a planet that's one and a half times the size that we have on our, in order to sustain ourselves and um and uh, yeah definitely reducing our consumption and, and being more proactive in, in the things that we do do have and do consume such as seasonal produce making sure that if we are being vegetarians our diet is not just avocados every day from south america and and yeah education is is one of the most important attributes asking the questions having having these topics of discussion so do appreciate that you've you've come here today to to inform us all on, on the steps that we can take so one of the questions that's come from the audience as well is um is sustainable palm oil really sustainable and are the alternatives which have shorter or long-term impact sorry are the alternatives which have a shorter long-term impact that we could be using instead i'll just change that around so is sustainable palm oil really sustainable and are the alternatives um better and in the short term or could we using could we be using alternatives instead okay yeah no i understand the question it's a, it's a very good question actually okay the first thing about palm oil i should say is that it's an amazing crop okay so first of all um where it's grown it doesn't effectively have seasons so directly you've harvested you can replant so that's the key thing the yields of palm oil as compared with other things like um i don't know um or seed rape or, or sunflower oil or, or one of the others, uh, the, the yields from palm oil are significantly higher. So an alternative isn't to plant something other than palm oil to get the same amount of oil because you just wouldn't. You'd need significantly bigger area if you were trying to replace palm oil with oil seed rape or one of the others. So palm oil is incredibly versatile, but we probably don't need to be consuming as much as we are. There are proper certification regimes, but how well they're policed is obviously always a question. And um, we know that people in, in the Amazon who are trying to investigate and check on these things are quite often intimidated and so on. So that's another part of it. But um, the other thing is that in my little talk, I, I, I showed some examples of what palm oil is used in. And there are certain foods like peanut butter where, yeah, probably palm oil would be difficult to replace. But the other thing I showed was plastic bottles of liquid soap. And, you know, today we're talking about climate change. But on another occasion, I could be talking to you about the evils of single use plastic. And, um, you know, to me, uh, that sort of liquid soap in a plastic throwaway container is a problem and that a bar of soap that doesn't contain any or as much palm oil because the palm oil makes it much more runny, doesn't need to be runny if it's in a bar of soap, would be a better alternative. And so, you know, manufacturers have started to put palm oil into a lot of things that it doesn't need to be in just to make them more convenient, convenient like liquid soap and so on so probably worldwide we use more palm oil than we need to and we're growing it in places that we shouldn't really be growing it in so there are alternatives some of those other areas may not produce such big yields but they wouldn't involve destroying the amazon so there's a combination of things reducing the use where it doesn't need to be it's not an essential part um and um, also strengthening the regimes that certify sustainable palm oil. So it's a combination of things that need to come in in order to protect the, 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 the rest of the Amazon. Thank you once again, Richard. And I think one, one um, important factor that you have highlighted is lots and lots of companies have kind of taken away some attributes that we used to have in the past, like using a bar of soap to make life more convenient for us so it's it's a it's a matter of us taking that kind of next step forward to making sure that we we do input a bit more time into into things that are going to have a better future for the generations 
in front of us. Um, another really important question that I've got is seeing as we are Hindu Climate Action and we are a faith-based group, we wanted to ask you that, how do you find faith ties into your desire for climate change? Because I know you mentioned that you are very active in, in, um, in the yep. church as well. Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, just to just to explain, I'm a I'm a Christian. I'm a uh, I belong to a Methodist church uh, where I live in in Nailsy, just outside of Bristol. And uh, yeah, it, it is an important part. I believe that we are stewards. That we do have a responsibility. That uh, we didn't inherit the planet from our parents. We are holding it in trust for our children, and that we have a responsibility to pass it on in a good shape to them. I have grandchildren now um, and I wonder what sort of planet, what sort of earth they will be um, in, inhabiting when when I'm long gone. So, um, yeah, faith does have a large part of it. The, the church I belong to, a number of the people within our congregation do um, do feel that uh, environmentalism uh, is a, no, you know, completely meshes with their faith and and is a a key part of our responsibility that our service should be part of our service should be that. So for me, yes, it's a key part. I can't say that for all Christians. Um, and, uh, you know, there have been uh, other Christians who feel that, you know, the planet's just been given to us and uh, we do with it what we like. That isn't my belief. And increasingly, I would say, it's not the belief of many others in uh, Christians. And I think that's spilling over into, uh, you know, I think many other faiths are also, perhaps some of them have been much more in harmony with nature than Christianity has. Christianity doesn't particularly have, um, well, that's not true. If we go back to somebody like St. Francis of Assisi, then we can see somebody in harmony with nature. But there was a there was a big period of time where maybe we weren't. But I think we are we're moving back that way now. And I think it is um, a strong thread throughout. Um, faith. And I mean, the, and the other thing is that um, we've talked a lot about um, sort of animals and plants and things. And we did talk briefly about the indigenous people. But. The truth of the matter is the people who will suffer most, certainly initially from climate change, are going to be those who are the most vulnerable, the poorest in society, the least resilient in society. And again, you know, the Christian teaching and that of many other faiths says that we have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters, and especially to those who are vulnerable, poor, sick, or least able to help themselves in their in the um, environment and in the situation they find them. So I think that's a strong, a strong driver as well, that we have to recognise that the people who are going to suffer most from climate change are the poorest and most vulnerable in society. And, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of aspects of that. But yeah, so that's, that's why I think it's important. Just wrap up um, what you said very well. Funny, funny enough, you mentioned Assisi. So the Hindu declaration at Assisi in 1986 actually stressed that humans are part of nature and in that undoubtedly linked to everything else on this earth. And God is revealed through the graded scale of evolution of which animals are just one element. And even though when we are part of this element and 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 yeah, we share this earth not only with with ourselves but with everything all living beings as such and i think a lot of hindus can say this as well but the belief in karma should encourage us to ex accept responsibility for our actions including how we treat our environment so a lot of what you have said does definitely tie in with faith and it follows on to my last and final question for you it's, you've been doing this work for a few years now and have you found that climate change awareness has has changed over the past 10 years so. Yes, I, I mean, I, th I think I think it has, and certainly around young people. I go into schools a lot, um, give talks, um, and the 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 response to questions and answers and their knowledge is certainly stronger than it was. Um, and I, I think they do understand. One of the problems, though, is that um, it 
it seems like too big a problem and it's almost like, well, what can I do? I'm only one person. Um, to which I'd say that, you know, um, the, the social anthropologist Margaret Mead said um, that something, the quote goes something like this, um, you know, don't believe that a small group of, of committed people can't change the world. Indeed, nothing else ever has. And effectively, what it means is that, you know, all of the great movements have started with a small group of dedicated, committed people. And uh, I think that uh, we can. And I think, you know, only, only yesterday, um, the new president of the United States, and obviously, United States is a key player in any, in anything that's going to happen about climate change. United States, their climate footprint is massive compared, you know, if you compare somebody in North America with somebody in Africa, there's, you know, the, the, the climate, the carbon footprint is like 25 times as big or something. So, um, but Joe Biden phoned Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson is going to be uh, hosting the COP discussions, which were put off from last year because of COVID, they're going to take place uh, towards the end of this year. And the fact that, um, you know, the United States has rejoined the Paris Accord and uh, the fact that Boris Johnson has made the right noises about it. You know, obviously, there's a big step from saying things and actually doing them. But there's uh, the, 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 the politicians and people in the public in general, I think, are far more aware now and understand. And I think uh, that's been brought home by the fact that people know that the, you know, 18 of the 20 years of the 21st century have been the hottest on record. People have seen people who, you know, floods that were only supposed to happen once in 100 years are happening once every three or four years now. So people can see the changes themselves, you know. Um, so I don't, th I, less people need convincing. There's fewer climate deniers. And to be honest, the climate deniers are the same people who believe that uh, the Earth's flat or that um, Hillary Clinton was an alien. You know, they're just you know, the, hopefully they can be put on one side and the sane people can tackle the problem. Thanks once again, Richard. I think you've done a great job at, at raising awareness as well on your part for all our viewers today. And um, if, if, if everyone who's been watching has felt inspired, there's, a, there's our page, hinduclimateaction.org, where you can make your climate pledge so if you log into our website and if you go on to our projects that we have a climate pledge where you can choose to take further action and and yeah your selfless acts will be an inspiration and on there you can take different pledges such as um reducing your fast fashion uh reducing what well, making changes to your diet as we've, as we've definitely highlighted today and taking um, pledges on your transport so how you get to work or or even just yeah traveling day to day and we also have a competition going on um in partnership with uh, nhsf where you can grow well you can either decide to cook a, ve a vegan meal you can upcycle something or you can watch a watch a uh, climate change documentary there's plenty of plenty of them out there and for every um, for every point that you get, we can do climate action is going to take a pledge to plant two trees, depending on how many points you score. And these are just some of the steps that you you can take. There's more resources out there on our on our website. And if you do have any more questions, feel free to post them in our on our YouTube comment section, and we will do our best to answer them. So I'm just going to pass it back to Richard now, who can who can finalise everything that has been saying, and just give him um yeah just give him the final remarks. Over to you, Richard. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, so I just you know just harking back to one of the points that you made about meat being a, a luxury. Yeah, when I was a young person, chicken was one of the most expensive, and it was a luxury meat. And chicken is now one of the cheapest meats that you can buy. And the reason is deforestation in the Amazon. There's a direct link, no question. Um, in terms of uh, 
you know, thoughts to go away with, yes, uh, reducing uh, our meat consumption is a key element to things that we personally can do. Sometimes you feel helpless. It's very difficult to think how you can have an impact. That's just one way. And it's a way that we can all do. And surprisingly, quite often doing the right thing has some pain that you have to accept. But actually, in this case, doing the right thing can be a lot healthier as well. There's good evidence that suggests that vegetarians and vegans' life expectancy is a little bit longer than meat eaters. So uh, you can help yourself and you can help the planet. So that's the that's the message I'd leave you with. So, and I thank you very much for inviting me to join you today. Thank you very, very, very much once again, Richard. And I think a lot of our viewers today already know the benefits that come with having a vegetarian diet. Not only is our body kind of adapted to eating vegetarian diets, we will leave a, we will leave a world that's much better for our future generations as you've highlighted today.